got nothing else here. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started here with chapter four, and that's basically getting your bees, installing your bees, uh, setting up your hive equipment, etc. for that. So right now, you're at a state of anticipation, of course. All right. That's pretty much a very true statement. It doesn't matter if you're going to get Buckfast, uh, Cordovans, Caucasians, um, Carniolans, Italians, ankle biters, Saskatraz, uh, German black bees, whatever the breed of bees you're going to get. The most important thing is that your bees survive, and that's, that's about it there. Um, many times people will ask me, hey, what's the best type of bee to get? And, and I'm always telling them, it really boils down to what's going to work for you in your apiary. Um, each person has their own desires and preferences. So like for one person, they may be so super terrified of ever getting stung that the only concern on their mind is finding the most docile breed, regardless of it also being maybe a breed that's very susceptible to disease, maybe it's a breed that's going to need a lot of medical treatment, maybe it's a breed that um, is easy to swarm and other things like that. They don't care about any of the other downfalls of that breed, but because it is so super docile, that's the best bee for them. Somebody else, they may be really interested in, oh, a unique thing is like propolis. Uh, the German black bee is known for producing tons and tons of propolis in the colony. For the, you, those of you that don't know, uh, propolis can be harvested and it's for a lot of medicinal treatments. It's, a lot of people just eat propolis to uh, take care of headaches or they'll make it into um, different types of, what's the word for tincture. it? Tincture. Yeah, tinctures. Right. Thank you. Um, but they'll, they'll use propolis for that and that is a really good bee for that pro process there. Um, all bees produce wax. There's, there isn't really one that's ahead on that there. So, um, so anyhow, rather than taking up the next 30 minutes of your class trying to break down the different breeds and what each one is best for, um, there are studies out there that you can Google. I've got a small study on foliage Russian bees if you just want to look at. Uh, I just have like six different breeds on there and it says what the good things are and what some of the lower points are on a bar chart there. So if that'll give you a, a glimpse into some of the stuff there that you can look at. But So picking a bee that is appropriate for you is one of the things you should be thinking of right now. Second would be where are you going to put your hives? Um, you'll want a place that gets a lot of sun exposure in the summertime. If you were thinking of putting your bees down by a creek on your property in a shaded area and thinking that they were going to be nice and tucked out of the wind and stuff there, well, being in the shade and down by the creek there, they're going to be exposed to a lot more cool, damp moisture. And that can cause things like chalk brood. It can cause the hive to be less active during the hours of daylight and stuff there because they'll stay like cooler down there in the early morning with all the dampness. Um, there's other types of fungus that can become a problem with your hive. Even, even things like the longevity of your boxes. You'll, have more, you'll be more prone to wood rot and stuff down there. The, the, about the best place for summertime you can pick is a spot that's going to get every waking moment of sunlight hitting your hives. Um, a lot of people will say, face your hives to the, to the south or the southeast so they get that rising sun. Um, that could be just one of those myths that could be, it could be beneficial. I haven't seen a, a conclusive study on that, but I, I have seen a study that if you put bees in a circular object and let them build comb, they'll always build north to south on their frames. So if you have the hive facing the southeast, the bees are going to be prone to wanting to go north to south with their cone, and you'll actually uh, trigger them to build a little more burr comb. They'll want to connect the frames a little bit more and try to force it to go the, the one way instead of... 
instead of following your frames nice, they're going to be like, no, we want to go this way. So that's just a thought to put through your head there that if you do that southeast, you might have a little messier hives as opposed to going north to south to live in. So, oh, let's see here. You want it to be flat and accessible. There is nothing that is going to deter you from working your bees than sitting there going, huh, it's a really hot day. Do I want to take a wheelbarrow full of equipment down this hillside slope and then over a pathway and then et cetera, et cetera? You, you want this to be very accessible. You want to be able to, if you need to, drive your car right up to your beehive because for whatever reason, you're tired that day, it's too hot out, you, you want to be able to just pop your equipment out, work on your hive, and then get the heck out of it. So, um, let's see, I said there, avoiding damp, humid environments, southish. Oh, something to consider here, if you're gonna have your hives inside of a city, or even if you live in the countryside, if you have a neighbor that for some reason lives really close to you, two acreages right there together, um, you could technically have a yard space that is just the area here with the tables here that's like, what, eight foot by 12 foot there, a tiny grass plot. And if you had a fence that was over your head height, your neighbors wouldn't know you really have bees. Bees have a, a cool little habit that when they come out of the hive and they hit a structure, they fly up and then they fly that way and they don't come down usually until there's a flower they want to go through. Uh, there was an interesting story about five, six years ago where there was a gentleman in Chicago and he had one of those unique homes that have a courtyard right in the center of it and the area that he was living in didn't allow you to keep bees, but he had kept them for like 10, 15 years. Nobody knew that he had bees at all. And he only got ratted out because one day he called a plumber to fix a leak at his house. The plumber saw the courtyard with the bees and then started blabbing to everybody about this crazy guy that he had visited and it got to the wrong individuals and the city came in and forced him to get rid of all of his bees. But because the bees had to fly up over his house, they were just going to the city parks and the other areas, uh, the planters that the city had out there along the streetways, um, uh, different buildings like their museums, their um, oh, science and history places. They, I'm sounding like an idiot here, but you know how there's different city buildings where they do all the decorative landscaping and stuff? Well, the bees were going to those foraging and coming back to this guy's house and nobody knew he had them. So if you have really close by neighbors, if you have a privacy fence, a hedge, anything that can grow up to a substantial height, your neighbors are never going to be bothered unless they have a bird bath or a kid's swimming pool out there and that's the only water source within reasonable distance for the bees to hit. So, well, I guess there was the one point there, livestock concerns. Uh, for the most part, if you've got horses, pigs, cattle, as long as your beehives, you, you space them, you know, it's somewhere between 20, 30 feet away from them so that the livestock can't get that close to them, you shouldn't have too many problems. If you, if you have a real stinky situation like a, a hog lot, you're going to want to separate that further yet because the, the extra odors from the, the fecal matter will agitate the bees. So I, I would suggest not putting it near a pig lot, but like free range cattle and stuff out in a pasture. As long as you got the bees separated by a good distance by a fence there, that if the cattle came right up to the fence, you'll be fine still. All right. So this here, um, if you want to take a snapshot with your cell phone or just Refer to my, um, I'm, like I said, I'm recording all of these classes here, and I said it different nights, but I'm recording these classes. So if you don't get this tonight and you want to go back to this, this is a way that you can go ahead and look at an aerial view map and drop a, a circle on there to show the, basically the bees range of forage and stuff there. Bees will forage up to five miles in all directions. Um, 
Queens for mating purposes, they'll go about a mile in any direction and drones will only go a quarter of a mile. So if you're wondering if your hive swarms and they try to make a new queen, is she going to get genetics from somebody else's bees? Well, if you know nobody lives within a mile and a half of you that has bees, you can be pretty sure that your queen's going to come back and mate with your own drones. I say that and every so often a hive will swarm and maybe move into your area if there was, say like woods that you lived in, or if there was an old abandoned barn house somewhere close to you, they might move into the barn house that season. But most of the time, if you know nobody is actively keeping bees around you, you can just look at this and be pretty sure your queens are mating with your own hives. All right, this would be one of the setups that Doyle has used, right? Probably, yeah. Um, while Doyle likes to keep bees like a hobbyist with the, uh, and I say that because when you move commercial, you usually put your bees on pallets and it's locked down on the pallets. If you notice here, they all have bottom boards, they all have telescoping covers instead of the migratory covers that allow you to put the hives right up against each other side by side here. But even though he's um, doing this like a hobbyist, he is going out there to extremes and building a very stable platform for them. Um, stability of your hive is going to be really important as they fill those honey supers and it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. So if you set them, and I know there's photos coming up here and we'll look at it, but uh, if you don't start with a really good foundation your hive sits on, and then you have a wet, rainy year, and whatever is holding your hive starts to sink into the ground and change angles, well, as this gets taller, as you're putting boxes on it, that can affect it, and it only takes to be a little bit like the Leaning Tower of Pisa before those blocks want to sink even further in the ground and just tip over. So having a nice, stable platform to start with is great. Uh, if you notice here, he's gone ahead and either, that looks like a uh, cloth there, but you can also get uh, the plastic there and lay that down on the ground and it just, it saves you from having to go out there and mow the weeds down. So let's say you just are even going and getting a regular pallet from some construction site. You're not, you're not doing it commercialized or whatever with a formal bee pallet, but you're just putting a pallet on the ground for your bees. Make it easy for yourself and put some of that landscaper fabric under it first because you're going to have grass growing up through that pallet and then you're going to be out there with a weed whacker trying to mow it down as it comes up through the pallet. And bees don't like weed whackers and they don't like mowers. Uh, and you can't win with a mower because uh, if you mow them one direction, the exhaust on the mower blows towards your hive. The bees don't like the carbon monoxide and the hot air pumping out of the mower. You go the other direction, the grass clippings are shooting into it. They, I don't know why they design mowers that exhaust goes one way and grass clippings goes the other. At least if they did them both out the same side, then you could just keep going past your hives that one direction and not tick your bees off. But uh, yeah, um, I can have the most docile bees in the world and you put a big fistful of grass thrown in the front of the hive and they, they'll chase you a good 50 feet. <laughs> All right. This is overdoing it. At the White House, for some reason, somebody gave them, the, this was uh, back with Obama, they, they gave them cruddy advice in my opinion, but they literally poured a concrete foundation first of all. And then so the wood wasn't going to have contact with this concrete pad that would already be dry because it's above the ground there, they put blocks so that the wood would have even less, less exposure. And then it's pressure treated lumber and it's got bolts in it and it's an A-frame construction. So that is a enormously stable foundation there. But you see how that box, box, box there, comparison in size? it's already standing at this height. So what are they gonna do to work their bees? They're just to get in the first box. They're gonna have to bring step ladders out there to get in the very first box for an inspection or to add the bees to it or anything else. 
let alone trying to get to the honey supers up there. At that point, it's already over their head to try to access the honey supers. I have no idea why they did that, but that's a very stable foundation. I can't, I can't uh, say that's not. All right. All right, covered that. Midsummer that the hive could, yeah, it's, it's going to weigh a lot. Uh, second year, it's going to get enormously heavy on you. First year, the bees are really trying to fill, fill your first box with brand new comb. Your second box, you might get a, get a fur, one honey super on there and stuff. They're not going to do a whole lot of work here, uh, here in Iowa anyhow. Um, yep. All right, the only other thing for picking a location and, also, and picking stability and everything else there, while the most perfect place for bees would be out in the middle of a prairie where there's no trees or anything else, they get all that beautiful sunlight, all that warmth, also great forage and stuff there that, you know, they're not next to a, a cornfield, soybean or anything else like that. Um, one drawback is we are in Tornado Alley, so if, if you know that area is subject to really high winds, you might want to consider giving them a windbreak like in that prior slide there. He's got them up against the side of a building. I'm guessing that's the south side of the building so the hives get all the beautiful sunlight, but the building is going to be a windbreak for those hives. All right. Does anybody see any problems with this setup? <clears throat> any of the, before Ted answers, any of the students for this year? Yes. Uh, especially when you get over here, you can see that there's a pretty good degree of lean there. These are nice and straight. Those have some lean to them. In, in fact, it's, it's, if you were going to have any lean to your hive, it should be so that the hive is leaning a little bit, one to two degrees forward, so any rain that hits this um, entrance of the hive doesn't run back into your hive. If you're going to have uh, an angle to it at all, have it so rain would go out of the hive. Well, this one is leaning backwards, rain's going into it. That one's pretty darn straight. That one's very crooked going back. That one's not too bad. Well, the problem with it being crooked, like I was starting to say before, stuff sinks further into the ground when ground gets soft, and if the hives are heavy, you end up having a mess on your hands. I've had that happen to me. That's not my photo, but I've had that happen to me in the middle of winter, and it's just disheartening. I mean, I just, I stand just fell over. Uh, wind pushed it over effectively, and three hives were there. I lost two of them. One survived, but at that point there wasn't anything I could do for them. Looking back, I put my hives on cinder blocks that were on end like this, and they were solid for a year and a half of being there. And then uh, a wind just pushed that whole thing down the street. So just a loss. So I had something similar to this. It wasn't just two hives, two hives, two hives, two hives. I had it so that these two by fours basically were connected, connected, connected all the way down the line. And I had like 20 hives out in this pasture. here. This was before I, I started thinking about pollination contracts and was putting them on four-way pallets. I was still doing it with bottom boards and stuff there. But I had them all connected up. I had them nice and flat. Uh, my two by fours were all sitting on double cinder blocks there, lifted up there, so everything seemed fine and dandy. And for a wind break, uh, the farmer had all these giant bales of hay that he had lined up down the field there. Sometime in the winter, and this, this farmer that was doing the bales of hay, he was renting the ground from somebody else. So. I just want to put that caveat out there. It wasn't, I had an agreement with the farmer that owned the land to put it there, and the other guy knew about it and was okay about it, but my agreement wasn't with the hay, hay gentleman. So anyhow, long story short, sometime in the winter time there, he goes to pick up one of those bales to feed his cattle, and he pulls too far forward. He came from the backside, 
hit into the bale with the forks and push the bale right into my stand of hives. And obviously, if they're all connected, even though it would have only knocked over two or three, it knocked over all 20 of them. And to make things worse, he was worried about what he did, but he didn't want to tell the landowner to tell me about it. I, the, the, the landowner just happened to come out there a number of days after it had happened to, I, I don't know, I think they were um, checking for deer trails and stuff because they also had some great river land around down there and stuff. But uh, anyhow, so the landowner calls me up. He's like, I don't know when this happened, but all your hives are laying over. I get out there. I could see the tracks from the, the farm tractor having pulled up there and done this and stuff. And I saved two hives out of the 20, and it was just because the boxes had been so propolized together, so stuck together, that the bees could still have enough of a mass in there to keep themselves warm. Otherwise, when it's like this, in the wintertime, all spread out, they couldn't fight it. The, the cold just got to them. If I could have got to them the same day that this happened, I probably could have saved all 20 still, but not when that happened. So. Just, just food for thought when you're picking locations of the different things that could happen to you. Does anybody see anything that should make them happy about this photo? Dandelions? Yes. Right here, we have dandelions starting to pop open there. Uh, and I, Doyle made sure to put the date on there for letting you know that that was March 7th that the dandelions were popping open there and stuff. Um, this isn't really on location, but dandelions are just such a relief to any beekeeper coming out of wintertime. Because when you see dandelions popping open, you know that the bees are going to have enough pollen coming in the front door and they're going to have a usually enough nectar source that you don't have to worry about them starving out at that point. It, it's, in Iowa, that's usually your safety net point. My hives are alive, and I got dandelions blooming. Cool, they shouldn't die at this point. Shouldn't die. All right. And just two months later, he's already got, on some of those hives there, five honey supers. I'm guessing that uh, if I had to, if I had if I could open those up right now, I'm guessing three of those boxes uh, probably have capped honey in them. And those other two there, just because they were going to town so fast here and uh, he knows what's still blooming in his environment, that's something to really uh, train yourself on is knowing when basswood is going to be in bloom, when, when white Dutch clover is blooming, when locust, uh, black locust is going to be blooming. Start picturing these nice heavy nectar flows that are going to come out there and when they hit on a calendar. Um, those planters that Julia McGuire um, uh, wrote up there as part of her grant that are free for you guys to take, um, there's pages there that you can make notes. So in the coming years there, you can refer back to your notes and go, oh, well, this year all this stuff was blooming and I saw honey coming in the front door. Let's go ahead and proactively put two boxes on my hive just so they don't get packed on. And again, another shot there. Um, your hives, when they come out of wintertime, do can pack on a lot of honey there. This year, I don't know if uh, Doyle made a split, if maybe one of his hives was going to swarm or was superseding their queen, or he just proactively made a split there, but that's probably what was going on there. You see a hive that only has two boxes compared to all these other monster ones. I mean. Once in a while, you do have one that's just piddling along. If you have multiple hives and you have one piddling along, probably something isn't right with that hive. That's why people uh, in class, classes, I should say, not people, classes here in Iowa usually are pushing people to buy two hives your first year. You have a comparison there that you can make between the two hives as they're growing. Yes? So I know that, I think it was last week in class, and in the book it talked about just switching places with them, but when they're that close, would the switch place allow for... It, it does actually still. Okay. Um, there's a thing called drifting where bees sometimes go to the wrong hive. Like, 
it's hard to show you up here or whatever, but as the bees are leaving their hive, maybe there's a really good nectar source out that direction. Uh, there's a 80 acres of grassland prairie that has right now yellow clover in bloom. Well, the bees hone in on these major nectar sources, so the bees are all coming out the hive, turning directions and going that way a whole bunch. You'll find out that as the bees come home for the day, these hives that are on this end of the strip, because the bees are coming back from this direction, they'll get 10 to 20 percent more population boost because the bees that are passing by there are like, so down here, the bees that would be going to that hive might end up in that hive just by accident, a small percentage. The bees that were supposed to end up in that hive might by accident end up in that one. But for the most part, they will find their correct hive. With that being said, we had talked last class about if that one was just piddling along, you could trade places with it and like this, I wouldn't want to pick that one up. That's too, that's too heavy. But you know, this one's doing good. I might swap places and get a boost. But I'd want to do an inspection first. Because if I look at that uh, too deep hive there, and I'm seeing like a, a shotgun brood pattern, meaning, and we'll, at the very end of this class, there's slides of good brood pattern and bad. So I'll bring that top. That's, uh, I'm bad tonight with spitting words out. I'll bring that word up again at that time, but if I saw a shotgun brood pattern, I'd be like, well, something's wrong with my queen, or there's some disease in my hive, or something's not right here. So switching places wouldn't necessarily fix that. Yeah, I'd give them a population boost, but there's something else I need to pay attention to. Or if I saw a bunch of chalk brood in there, or any of the other nasty things we'll cover in the one of the last two classes where we get into the diseases and parasites and problems that, that the hives get into, I want to check to see if that's going on before I just boosted the, the resources. So back to, back to getting two hives. It's always suggested to do that for the reason that you can have a visual comparison. And if something goes wrong and you lose a queen out of one hive, they try to make their own queen and they fail at it because only one queen survives that battle royal. She goes out on her maiden fly and gets ate by, you know, a blue jay or a dragonfly or something. They don't have larva, the appropriate age anymore to make a second shot of it. You could technically take a frame of larva out of your, your good active hive and put it in there and give them a second shot. I don't usually like to give hives a second shot because I've already delayed them three weeks at that point because you have 16 days from, from egg to queen hatching out and then it's three days before she goes and gets mated and then it could be five to 10 days before she starts laying eggs. So you do the math and you, you've already busted out most of a month there. Well, you just gave them another frame of larva. You just sent it back another three weeks. I prefer if, if you failed that first time, just buy a queen. I don't want to set it back a month and a half at that point. So, but do whatever you want. It's, it's your beehives and stuff, but. So could you like they talk about them getting ready to swarm and they're making all of these queen cells. Can you let one of those hatch and then use it in a failing in a failing hive? Yes, you sure could. If you have a hive that you think the queen is the cause of the problems, her genetics, then certainly if you saw them, you just got lucky enough that the other hive was either swarming or whatever reason building all these queen cells. You can first year beekeepers hate doing this, but you can squish the queen in the other hive. Ooh. Uh, you can also pull her out and put her in a nuke, but I don't know what you're going to do with her because you're deciding you don't like her genetics, so you really just need to get rid of her somehow. But you can take one or two frames that have all those nice queen cells on them and put it in the hive then that had the, the failing genetics going on. And you would have shortened that window of the new queen popping out and the process starting all over. Yes? We talked a couple weeks ago about when a queen hatches, the first thing it does is goes around and kills all the other sister queens that are about to hatch also. Tries to. 
Yes, okay, but a mature queen won't go around and kill the, the, the queens that are about to hatch in these new, uh, you know, queen, egg, comb, whatever you call it. I haven't technically read published material on this, but as a queen breeder, I know that the queens will leave um, cells alone as they're being drawn out and fed the, fed the royal jelly and being turned into uh, fully developed cells. Um, if you had a situation, well, let's just keep going down the original road there. Typically, if they're drawing out cells, they'll kill their queen if it was a supersedure situation, a failing queen. They'll kill her before they get to fully capped over stage. They'll kill the old queen. And the queen doesn't bother cells that are drawing out. Um, if it's a swarm situation, the queen leaves the hive a day or two before the, those are gonna hatch. And she doesn't bother them at that point because all the worker bees are basically chasing her around the hive, making her skinny. She stops laying eggs, everything during that phase there. And I, I don't see them ever going after the, the cells at that stage because they're too busy running from all the attendants forcing them around. Out of curiosity, how do the worker bees kill the queen? Do they sting her or do they? Uh, yeah, they kind of ball her and they, they, they'll well, just yeah. gang up on her and they'll start trying to sting her and kill her. Mm -hmm. That's how they get rid of a failing queen when they have cells that are about ready to hatch. And isn't that what they do also if you put a thread that if you don't let them get the queen out, that they could reject that queen? And is that the same process of killing that queen? What, what, what you probably were reading is if you buy a queen mm -hmm. and you're going to introduce it into your hive, if you just buy a queen and release it into the hive there, they usually don't know that queen scent. It's completely foreign to them. The hive still smells like their old queen. Uh, even if it doesn't smell like the old queen because it's been queenless for like five, six days, that hive does not know the new queen scent and this is completely foreign to them. So just opening up a queen cage and releasing her, um, they'll usually just ball her and kill her because she's this foreign intruder. Um, normal queen introduction, you take a queen cage, you put it in the hive there, and there's actually for tonight's demo when we get into stuff here, this is one type of queen cage, and this part of the tube here is filled with a candy substance that, like those old commercials for lollipops on how many licks does it take to the get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop? Well, it takes the bees about three days to lick through this candy and in the three days, young nurse bees don't care that this isn't their queen. They just know it smells like a queen. They're super naive and they're going up and feeding the queen. And the queen has uh, special um, glands, mandibular glands that uh, are producing a queen substance, which is getting spread mouth to mouth by other bees. And it gets on the wax of the hive and the hive soon starts smelling like this new queen. And at some point, when the wax and the frames and the bees in the hive all smell like the queen, it's completely fine for her to come out of the cage and be released. Um, the size of your hive really depends on how quickly that happens. They do this picturing that the queen's going to go into a full-size hive that, oh, down here. A full-size hive that would be two deeps and two mediums they're picturing that for the three-day release on this, and that's why it's uh, pretty much industry standard. If you were trying to introduce this into a single deep box, that's less frames for that queen set to be distributed through. You could technically go out there on day two, check and see how they're behaving on the queen cage and release her early if you wanted to. Yeah, I remember reading in the, the, the book about that you come out and you see if they're around the queen and then you close the box back up and let them sit a little bit more because there are too many around it. But I didn't know how you know that there's too many or I just couldn't tell it from the... The, the, be the behavior of what they're doing on this cage okay. is pretty apparent. When they don't like the queen and they would ball her, they're just clinging to this like with a death grip. And you'll see different bees with trying to move their butts towards the cage there and sting the cage, but you no, know, she's walking around there. They can't harm her. They have an exoskeleton that 
we keep her pretty protected and stuff. When they're just casually walking on there and trying to put their mouth down and feed the queen and everybody's happy-go-lucky and you can brush the bees off and they just keep walking on the cage, that, that's when they've accepted her. All right, I gotta keep moving on here and stuff. Um, did I trail off from the original no, question? I think you're good, but I bet that double deep there, if that's uh, Doyle's bees, that's probably a swarming pot. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, he does collect a lot of swarms, so. Yeah. I was thinking he probably was making some splits, but yeah, probably a swarm. But a swarm. Oh, yeah. All right. To get to this point, starting a new column here. That photo there, I probably wouldn't have them that close to the ground when they're individual hives, but that's fine. All right. I don't want to skip ahead here. Yeah, I, I would have skipped ahead here. All right. You can start a hive from either a package of bees, which we've explained in other classes, a nucleus colony that you bought somebody, or a nuke for short. An established colony means that you bought a, basically you went to somebody's bee yard that was splitting off their own colonies and stuff and you literally bought that from them already with bees live and active in it, and you'll have put window screen in front of here and stuff so the bees couldn't come out and loaded the whole thing into the back of your truck, taken it home and opened it back up. So that's what an established colony means. You just bought somebody else's beehive. They usually sell them as singles, but you might get somebody that's selling doubles or even in the fall time, every so often on one of the beekeeping pages here locally, There'll be somebody that's just like, you know, I'm getting old, I want to get out of beekeeping, I have 10 hives, anybody want to buy them before winter time? And you can buy fully established hives there. You want to make sure that the hives you're buying have enough resources. Don't, don't buy hives that are bare bones, empty on, um, on honey stores, and then you're sitting there with two, three weeks before cold weather is going to set in and you're trying to pack feed into there. But, uh, and swarms. Swarms are fine once you already have hives. I, I always suggest that people do not buy equipment and plan on catching swarms their first year. You might put out five, ten swarm traps and you're still a beginning beekeeper. You haven't found really good areas that swarms might show up. There may not be any beekeepers near you that even swarms would come from. And you can't trust getting a swarm call of somebody calling you just because you've been telling all your friends that you're going to be a beekeeper. Because the people that have been doing this for 10, 20 years that like to go get swarms already have a vast network of people out there, already are on all these social media pages, already have contacted pest control companies so that when the pest control company gets a call saying, hey, there's a swarm of bees, well, they're not allowed to kill a swarm of bees because they're pollinators. So they'll call up a beekeeper that they have on their Rolodex and bingo bango, you're never informed about it. So don't trust that you're number one, you're gonna get a swarm. Um, this organization, the Friendly Beekeepers of Iowa, do suggest packages over nukes because of problems different members have had in the past where you buy nukes that you might be inheriting somebody else's problems. If you are going to buy nukes, buy from a very reputable source. Somebody that's not making just 10 or 20 in their backyard type of thing. If you are going to buy through somebody getting 10 or 20, make sure the state apiarist has come out there and check those. A, it's the law in Iowa that before you sell bees, you have to have had your apiary inspected. So if they're not doing that, they're technically breaking the law. And B, you want to make sure that they don't have American follow brood. That's the number one thing you don't want to inherit from them. There's a lot of other things you don't want to get in the equipment that could be there. But if you ever get American follow brood, you basically just have to torch the hive. There is no cure for American follow brood. European follow brood, there is. You can treat that with antibiotics and get it to go away. But the spores from American fall brood, you treat it and treat it and treat it, you think it's gone away, and maybe six months go by and you don't see it, 
Maybe a year and a half goes by and you don't see it, but those spores don't ever go away and sooner or later it pops back up in your hive. So basically they just say that you have to burn your equipment and the bees to get rid of American Fallbur and you don't want to accidentally buy that through somebody's nuke. It lives in the comb, literally. But nukes still are a great thing. Don't, don't, don't mean just because I said packages are a little more preferable. Everything in beekeeping is down to your preference. Everything is what's going to work best for you, okay? So, so nukes are still great. Yeah. Let's, go, let's go over the differences real quick between starting from a package and starting from a nuke. Uh, if you start from a package and, and you're a brand new beekeeper with all new equipment, you get to see the rate at which they will drop comb. You get to see the rate at which your queen's going to lay. Uh, you kind of need to be in there a bit because you may even need to be feeding them if, if uh, they're not going to have any feed right away. And if we get into um, your bees at time of the year where you know, if you make the mistake of getting your package early and there's no food out there, you're going you're gonna to be in there a lot. But you get to see what they do from, from square one, which I think is a really cool experience. Um, if you buy a nuke, you've got basically a fourth of a full hive there already, should have, of healthy bees, drawn comb, resources for them. So they're going to do well. It is kind of like getting a head start, but there's some things you don't get to see your bees do from scratch. They're kind of, they kind of started somewhere else and you're just getting them. There's a lot you, I think, kind of miss out on or can miss out on if, if all you have is a couple of hives that you started from, from a nucleus colony. They both get you where you want to go, but the experience is different. So if you're starting with two hives, can you do one nuke and one Absolutely. certainly two bees? Yes. I, yep, can do. And In fact, then, I've had a, a few people this year actually place those orders with me, and I was like, oh, well, A, the reason I, I cringe to that is because my packages are ready at one date, and the nukes are ready at a different time. So I'm like, uh, I see you live two and a half hours from me. You're going to have to make two trips for this. Because your package can't just sit on a store shelf. It's only going to... Um, the package itself here... I did not have a feed can. I always hate it. People bring them back to me, and I always have to throw them away. But... I don't have any spare feed cans with me. There's a feed can that sits in a package right here. Uh, it just looks like uh, canned preserves with no label or whatever there. But that feed can usually lasts anywhere around three, four days, and then it's empty, and you can't refill that steel can. It's, uh, it's got little, tiny little holes on the underside popped in it, and if you were to try refilling it, you've got to then cut it open some more to fill it up with syrup and then it's just going to run out when you flip it over. So, I've got, I've got one more difference. Uh, packages are going to be available earlier in the year, am I right on that? Uh, unless the nukes are coming from out of state because uh, I do, my, my, me personally I work with like the Koi family yeah. because so many of my customers basically don't want to wait until late May, early June to get their nukes. Right. And they're happy to get Richard Coy's packages out of, I mean, nukes out of Mississippi, as opposed to waiting for me to produce my own queens late May, early June. But if you get a package, and again, we don't have four, that package of bees has to be hived, like, soon. Like, it, that day or the next day? Like, yeah, yeah, because again, you only have no food. that, from the time the bees are shaken in that bee yard into the container and put into your hands, could already be a day or two. So at that point, you only have two days of feed left in that can. Well, let's say you didn't even come the first day to pick up packages, because normally there's a little window of time there. Uh, most people have two or three days that you can come and pick them up. So you might be on day three that you pick up your package, or day four. If it's day four, you really need to put them into your hive that day. Because once they run out of carbohydrates in there, they can't get out of the cage to go forage, and nobody can refill the feeder. They, they don't store nutrition like you and I, really. They run 90% of that adult bee is all off of carbohydrates running through their system. And when they run out of carbs, they just turn off. You could see them that morning alive and healthy and running around that package. 
and that evening, 90% of them dead on the bottom of it just because their carbs are out. So if you get a package and you delay installing them into a hive where there's feed, and then when you do get around to it, or you think you will, now there's bad weather or something else has come up and you don't get to it, it's, they're not going to last, they're not going to last long. If you get a nucleus colony, likely it's later in the year, but they're, they're already in the nuke. They, if you bought a good nuke, they should have food stores. You can kind of put them where you want them to be. Maybe not necessarily even put them into your equipment yet. They should be fine as long as they have an opening and there's food in there for a few days. And then you can, you can install that nuke into your equipment really when, the, when it, you have more options when it's better for you to do it. Well, with, with the package, you can do it in freezing temperatures and stuff. There, there's just a different process to it. It's not any fun. It's, it's actually not that bad if it's freezing temperatures because the bees aren't flying. They stay clustered. So, But uh, we'll, we'll get into some of those unique situations and stuff here. So, installing a package. Um, it's good to get a spray bottle like this, be, you know, several weeks out, get prepped for this and stuff here. But get a, get a spray bottle here and get yourself some table sugar if you don't already have it at home. And you'll want to do like a one-to-one -one mix. So half water, half sugar that you put into there and get it all dissolved up and stuff and ready. You want, you can have it even thinner than that, but don't go thicker because it's not going to spray out of the spray bottle worth of darn. You want something that you can get the bees wet and sticky with. Um, you can go just plain water too because water will keep the bees from flying as much but that, that sugar really also draws the bees attention to licking the, the fluid off of them instead of trying to also go and do other things. So it's good to get some uh, sugar water all mixed up. It's good to have out in your apiary a hive already set up as just one deep, okay? Don't remember from the other classes, you don't want to give them two deeps or two deeps and two mediums right off the bat because they'll try to chimney up that center of that hive on you there. Um, so have your, have your hive ready, have it in the location you want, all set up on a nice firm foundation there like we talked about here. Um, you'll need a, you don't technically need the hive tool your first time, but it does help you get underneath the serp can and pull it out. I, I typically don't even mess with it because I'll show you my process here and I can just use my fingers to do the stuff with it here. Um, and again, that's what works for me. It may not work for you. You may prefer to have the hive tool. You'll want at least a bee veil on a nice warm day while you're doing this. Uh, entrance reducer is advised and I'll get into that here later. Uh, a feeder of some sort inside the colony. If you're doing the package, even if you've already got dandelions blooming out there and they say it's going to be good weather, you know how often weathermen are wrong when they're, when they're telling you that, oh, hey, tomorrow's going to be beautiful and you get a foot of snow? Or they say, oh, yeah, we've got, you know, the worst storm in ages coming and it's a mild breeze. So they, they get it wrong all the time. Don't trust that weather report. I want you to already have a feeder in your box, okay? And I, I want you to have that full of uh, one to one um, sugar syrup to have that package go on, okay? Even if you got the dandelions blooming, just in case you've got a cold snap that hits you there, they've got food in that hive. That's, that's your insurance there. Uh, it says half a pollen pattern. I don't ever even mess with that in the springtime, but. It, it's something you can do. If the dandelions are already blooming, a lot of times they just ignore that pollen patty because they got fresh pollen in in ample amounts in the environment and that pollen patty just sitting inside your hive, it starts attracting like garbage bugs. If there's a commercial bee producer that, uh, or a commercial uh, pollinator that brings back 3,000 colonies and have them within a few miles of you, they also bring back hive beetles, and right off the bat, they're smelling those pollen patties, and it attracts them to your hive and stuff. So if you've got a good pollen flow going on, you might, you might just skip the half pollen patty. If you don't think you've got a good pollen flow already going on, it doesn't hurt to throw it on. 
Frankly, after about a week, if you see them not touching the pollen padding, I'd say pull it out of there and throw it in the trash. That way you're not really attracting all the little nasty bugs to come in there as the pollen padding just sits there and basically rots. All right. You get your package. Uh, when you're bringing it home, I, I say put it in like the back seat of your car and have the windows down. Have a nice breeze going through there. Um, if you don't want to have the windows down, just make sure the interior temperature of your car is, if anything, on the cold side. These guys are stuck in here and they emit a lot of heat there. They're all, they're pa all packed up. And when they're in a ball like that, um, they can't temperature regulate themselves like they can in a hive. Normally in a hive, the bees are on the frames and they can all face one direction and beat their wings and push air up one side of the hive and down the other to basically act like air conditioning. They can't do that in a package. So rather than have the windows up, having the sun beating down on them as you're driving home and stuff there, uh, Put the windows down. If you're in a truck and it's, you know, 45, 50 degrees out day, it's fine to have them in the bed of the truck. I wouldn't do it if it's like 32 degrees outside or colder, but even if it's like 40, 50 degrees, they'll be fine in a package in a bed of a truck driving home to your place. Maybe if you're six hours away, you might worry about them a little bit if it's hanging in the 40s there, but they're really good about warming themselves up. They're not good about cooling themselves down. Um, do not put the bees in your trunk and then pull into a store and go shopping for an hour. When you come out, more than likely your bees are going to be cooked in your trunk. The sun beating down on your trunk and then the bees also emitting all that heat and not having air flow in there they'll warm up in a trunk really bad, so don't, don't do that to them. At least when you're driving down the road, the air whipping on the metal of your trunk there will usually keep it just fine for temperature-wise and stuff. But you go shopping and there's no air pushing over that trunk, it actually just heats up like a hot plate. You have about, um, not quite halfway through the fence. Not quite stars. halfway through, and you know, yeah. we're doing all right yeah, on right on track. Yeah. All right, here. We're finally to the stage here of installing your bees. I'm gonna really not want to follow the slides here. When I get this home, when I get this home here, and I go out into my apiary and my hive would have been closed up and stuff, I'm just gonna set this on the ground next to the hive here. Um, I shouldn't have to use this hive tool if I've got all brand new equipment. I should be able to just get my fingers in here, but this is, Ted's box that already has drawn comb stuff here, so I'm going to have to use the hive tool. It's a little tight. Uh, some of the stuff is propolized too. So. Oh goodness, Ted. You got sticky frames. I do. All right. So, with the bees sitting off there to the side, I'm going to make. I'm going to make a nice opening here in those frames, okay? And remember, yours will be brand new, not with any comb there and stuff, but, and you're not going to tip it up there or whatever. I'm just for showing you here. I'm going to take out about four frames to create a space in there. I'm also going to have an entrance reducer here with just the smallest setting open here. Um, you want to do that just so that the bees, once they're in there, it's not so you're trapping them in there, but they'll have reduced flow of coming in and out of there. And also if there's any established colonies within a couple of miles of you, they don't in the next coming days start picking on this colony and trying to get to the food source and stuff like that. That'll just help them out by having it on the small setting. Also you're in early spring, that'll also help keep some of the warmth from this colony in the early stages inside of there. So, I, I prepped the hive here, and now I come over to my package. I need more space, don't I, so I'm not in that light. Alrighty here. 
you'll probably have uh, a V veil on and some gloves, uh, especially if it's 40, 50 degrees outside, you know, springtime temps. So anyhow, at this point, you have all the bees in here. You have a feed can that's sitting in this spot, and this little slit here will have your queen suspended from there. I, I don't have one of the little tabs here to hold on to it, but she's suspended right next to the feed can down inside of there. So as you see on the slide there, there's a person with a spray bottle and stuff here. I'll take the package and I'll sit here and I'll go psh, 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 spray it down pretty good here. You know, it might be like six to eight squirts from the spray bottle on this side. I'll flip it to the other side, spray it a few times. If the bees, I want the bees to get sticky. I want them to start going together. So I might tap that down, shake it side to side, and if it looks like they're sticking together and starting to roll around like a dough ball, that's good. If they don't seem to be sticking together, like rolling around like a dough ball, and instead are like climbing up on the sides there, and, um, still spreading out, I'll spray it down some more. I want these girls to be all covered in the, the sticky spray there and stuff. But at some point, when you tap it down again or you hit it here like this, you should be able to do this and you'll see all the bees stuck together and they literally just move around like a, a, a black dough ball in here. At that point, you're pretty safe to, I like to just tap it a little bit down on the ground on the top of the hive there and my feed can usually pops out like a quarter of an inch and I can just grab it with my fingers and pull it out. Uh, if it doesn't do that, I, I just do a little bit and I can usually work my fingernails under the side and pull it out. This is where my instructions differ a little bit and uh, they would say use a tie tool and pry under the can and pull it out and I think it's showing that right there in that slide, getting underneath the feed can with your hive tool and trying to get it out of it. So once you get your fingers around your, your feed can there, the bees may have had time to start breaking that dough ball and being all over the cage, okay? Well, at that point, again, I'm going to do one hard slap down, okay? So I guess I'm not up in the video there, but I'll just do one hard wrap like that while I'm holding on to the can. Don't drop the can down in there. And all the bees are going to fall down in there. I can pull the can out, slide my queen cage out, give a quick look of her, and if I see that um, she's alive and healthy, you want to make sure that she's alive, because if she's dead in the cage, maybe one to two percent of packages for whatever reason, they didn't take to the queen, maybe she got too hot, something like that. She may be dead in there. Anybody selling packages have some emergency queens. You would get on the phone and call them up and tell them that, hey, I have a dead queen. And at that moment that you notice the queen's dead, just put that feed can back down in there and trap the bees. You're going to want to get a new queen before you put them in there, okay? I want to stop that here and just tell you that. Um, if you have a super long drive ahead of you, when you're picking up the bees from your, whoever you're buying them from, you might, right there at the place, tap the bees down and see if you can see the queen cage. If you can't, you might want to tap it like this, get a hold of that syrup can, tap it down real quick, slide the queen out, immediately put that over there, because they're not sticky. They're going to want to fly on you. You're just trying to get them off of the feed can and get access. Take a look at your queen. You can do another tap and put the queen back in. But you just don't want to drive three hours and realize you've got to drive three hours back and get a, a, a replacement queen. So I'm going to throw that caveat there. So we've got the queen out. She's alive. She's off to the side. We've got our bees here. Unfortunately, you're going to do again, pop it down, and pull the feed can the rest of the way out, and sit there and shake your bees, and they're going to roll around and so I'm going where it's more visible for you guys. That ball that's over there, you're going to flip it over so the hole's facing down. 
and you're going to try to knock the ball in there. You'll get like 80-90% of the bees. Some of them will be on the screen, some walking around and stuff, but you can then tap it, go like this, and you're not hurting them. You're just getting them to let go with their feet and roll around in there and fall into here. The bees are all sticky. They're all in a big mass. That's about the best you're going to see here in this photo here, but they'll be down in there as a giant mass in that opening of your hive. And that's why you have the frames out there. If you just dump them on the tops of the bars here, you're going to have this big mass that you don't know what to do with. Projector slid down just a little bit. Oh, weird. Yeah. There you go. All right. So I think the book said you could put that the whole box in there. What's that? Is there a benefit to it? We'll, we'll get on to that other. It, it's usually not suggested to be done that way. That would be in situations where you've got temperature issues and some other considerations. But usually getting the bees sprayed down and knocked into the hive is, mm -hmm. is the way most people suggest doing it. Um, so you've got your queen, and I have now misplaced the cage. Thank you. <laughs> so this is just one type of queen cage. You're going to have a variety of out, out there. Some of them um, have, some of them are like this with a big candy plug here with the two holes there. <laughs> Um, is there any? Some of them are the California mini cages. Um, some of them are the JZBZ um, plastic cages and stuff there. There's a variety. All right. In rare cases, and I'll, I'm saying rare because here in Iowa, most of the packages you buy are not going to have a candy plug with the loose bees. They're going to have a solid cork in them and nothing else. Um, once the queen has been with a package of bees for 24 hours, she can be directly released with those bees. They don't have comb that would have an old queen scent. They've been around her and passing around that queen pheromone scent to the mass of bees that are there, and they take to her really well. So for most packages you buy, they just have a solid cork, and they're going to tell you to do a direct release into the bees here. In the rare instances where that package was shaken that morning, they will have a candy plug for you where you're going to probably have a little solid cork here that you have to remove, and then the bees will have three days to eat away at the food to release the queen to your package. And in that case, you will have all your loose bees down in here and I personally, this is a little trick I'm going to tell you guys. Rather than trying to squeeze frames in here with a ball of bees that are all sticky there, maybe squashing some of them or having difficulty, once you have your pile of bees in here, throw your inner cover on there and just leave them alone for like 15, 20 minutes. The bees lick themselves clean and they walk up onto the frames and they calm down. And you now have, when you come back, the bees are on the frames and not in that big sticky ball and you have room to put the frames that you took out back in the colony. So at that point, if you have a candy plug, you would suspend the queen cage between two frames, close the col you already put your frames in there, close the colony back up completely and be on your merry way. If you don't have um, that candy plug, the easiest best way that I've ever come up with all these years of releasing queens is what I call my grenade method. I've got the big, I've got the sticky pile of bees down in there and stuff, and this is my grenade. I pull the cork out of it. I know that this one doesn't have a cork and it's already got the candy too, but make believe here with me that it's one of those other cage types and there's no candy in it. I'll pull the cork out and I put my finger over it just like I'm holding the, the, the firing spring on a grenade. And here's my, here's my hive with all my sticky bees on it. 
that alone 15 minutes two hours it doesn't matter at that point the bees are going to clean themselves off at some point the queen's going to walk out of that cage she's going to walk up onto the frames too the bees calm down they get situated in their hive and now you can come back you come back to the hive there and you can reach down in there and pull the empty queen cage out of the hive there And go ahead and put your frames back in the hive with bees all on the existing frames that were in the hive there that are no longer in your way and are going about their merry business. That's the way I like to do it. You need to smoke them to do that or will they just let you do it? Typically, I don't use any smoke for installing a package. If I was installing a nuke, and the bees were being a little defensive, I would give them a little puff of smoke to start off with and then frame by frame take them out of the nuke box and put them in here. Really installing a nuke really just boils down to that. You just take the five frames one by one and put them into your existing hive. All the bees are on there. You might have a few walking around the inside of the nuke that you can just flip over and, and shake and then close your hive up and stuff there. It's, it's that simple. The only, the only concern you should have with installing that nuke is the first frame you pull out of there, try to make there's some extra space there on either side of the frame so you don't do that thing I was talking about in the other video of rolling bees as you're pulling that first frame out. When you get to the second frame, you've got tons of space. You could use your hive tool and pop it over, pull it out, pop the next one over, pull it out. It's just that first one. Try to be careful with it. So... Other than my grenade method, you can also go about popping the cage open and sitting there waiting for the queen to walk out. This can be a little more risky. That's why I like the grenade method so much. Young queens that have just been mated and then been caged up, they haven't been laying 1,500 eggs a day for the last several weeks. They've only just started laying eggs, so their abdomens aren't fully filled out yet, and they can technically fly. Most of the time, when you hold that cage open like this, she will walk out and want to walk down into the darkness with the other bees and go down there. One out of ten times, she is going to walk right out, walk up onto the plastic, look at you, and fly off into the blue. <laughs> she's not oriented to this hive. She's never been here before. She's just lost now. And now you've got a queenless colony. You're going to be getting on the phone with your package supplier going, hey, my queen flew away. Uh, what, what also sometimes happens is you're trying to let that queen come out of the cage here. And she walks up onto the cage and you freak out and you try to quick maneuver her and you squash her with your thumb or your forefinger or whatever. Some of those things happen. Guess what? None of those things happen with the grenade method. It's, it's so simple. And you can have 40 hives all lined up, all with the covers off, sit there, shake that package, dump it in there, dump the queen, put the lid on, walk down the line, walk down the line, walk down the line, and keep doing this. By the time you're done on the end of the line, then you go back to hive number one. They're all calming up on the frames, and you're ready to close them all up. You didn't waste five hours of your day waiting for each one and trying to mess with them. You just made it a one hour event to install 40 packages instead. All right. Question, Jason. Yes. What do you do with the bees that you just can't get out of that package? They're still in the box. I'm usually good enough about wrapping it on something solid. I get all the bees I want out of this package. But, <laughs> If you finally say, hey, I give up, and there's a chunk of bees still in here, and you don't feel comfortable uh, messing around with it, once the queen's in there and most of your colony's in there, you can just set this in front of your hive, and sooner or later the bees clean themselves up here, they'll walk around, they'll come up to here, and they usually go inside the hive there because they're smelling the, 
the queen scent there. The bees are fanning inside there, and the queen scent's coming out that reduced entrance, and they smell her, and they go inside. Um, so, do we need to take a break now? And I'll come back. Time to take a break. All right. I'll try to get back to first thing after break here. Remind me is what you saw in the book there for having the cage inside of a hive and installing the bees that. Let's try to five minutes. We're, we're going a little long, but this is all good stuff. So, we'll have to so before break, we showed how to install a package of bees, but we were going to cover in some suggested posts on YouTube, and in some books they do talk about not shaking the bees out of the package and installing them um, internally. For that, you do still remove the syrup can, and uh, you can put them in here like this, you can pull a couple of frames out, and I'm just having to turn it this way because of the direction you guys can see, but it would sit over the open space, and a lot of times you pin that queen cage between your two frames underneath the opening and you're trying to encourage them to come out of there. Um, when you're doing this type of install, it's usually because cold weather is happening at that time that would be cold enough you don't want to spray them down with the sugar water because it would be like hypothermia. Um, you know, 40 degree day, you fall into a creek and you've got to walk home. You normally wouldn't die in those temperatures, but you now are soaking wet. And the bees are the same way. If they're soaking wet and it's too cold outside, it's not good for them, and you can actually kill your bees that way. So if it's too cold outside, they do have a method like this. I actually find if it's too stinking cold outside, I still like to install my bees by shaking them out of the box here but I don't spray them down or anything. I'll put a veil on and stuff, and the cold weather makes the bees not really want to even fly. They'll really want to stay as a cluster. So rather than shaking them around like a dough ball, I'll take my syrup can out, and I'll immediately just start wrapping them out and letting them fall into that group, and I'll close up the hive and stuff there. But back to, back to the suggestions with this. Once that's in there and you're trying to entice the bees out of that, you would take, I don't have an empty box real hand ready here, but you would take an empty box, set it over, put your inner cover and top cover over it so it's a sealed environment, and you'd leave it overnight there. Hopefully the bees are enticed to move down onto the frames, keep the queen warm, access the feeder that's right over here to the side, and everything works out hunky-dory. That doesn't always happen. Um, I really, because of my situation as a, a, a bee producer, as a bee retailer, I get enough of these phone calls to know that in cold situations where people were gentle with their bees like this, there are times where they will call me up and say, um, my bees stayed in the package. They clumped up in the package there and they left the queen alone and she froze overnight. Well, this package smells like the queen. And if they're in a cold situation, they don't always move down into the hive there. And you just wasted a lot of money there by trying to be extra gentle with your bees. My suggestion, and you don't have to take it, there's a lot of people on YouTube and and obviously printed in some books that say that's fine. But if your reason is for cold that you're doing this to be gentle with the bees, I would say it's better to be a little rough with them and have them live than put yourself in a hopelessly queenless situation. You've now got to try and find somebody that will sell you a queen, get you a queen right away before they decide, hey, we have no queen, and they start absconding from the hive and just leaving there because no queen, no homing scent and everything else, especially if there's somebody with bees within like, if your neighbor has bees, that's really bad. If you have a second hive, pretty much that next day, they move out of this hive and move into the other one, and you have six pounds of bees in the other hive and nothing in this one. You, you really put yourself in a bad situation, okay? So, yes, it can be done. Yes, there is some reasons for doing it, but... I, I personally would suggest on the cold day, 
Just don't use spray. Shake them out. Close them up. Make sure your queen's in there. The bees that are flying around will try to go in there. You might have a few that stick to the outside of the hive and die on you, but it's better that the main mass gets in there with the queen and you have a living, functioning hive. Was there any other questions on that part? All right. It's not really as dramatic. I mean, installing patches is really pretty easy. Jason's going yeah. over some of the worst case scenarios. Yeah. He is. Installing patches is kind of a fun, fun day. Yeah, I mean, typically the bees are pretty docile because, again, it's almost a swarm situation. They don't have any um, brood that they're protecting. They don't have any eggs. They don't have any drawn comb. They, it's just loose bees and a queen there that you're installing the package from. You might, in all that shaking around and wrapping the, the, the bee package on your hive and stuff to get all the bees shaken out, you might tick off one or two bees that try to come after you. But if you got a veil and gloves on, it's, it's no big deal. All right, replace frames, yep. So the slides are talking about replacing the frames and stuff after installing them. With that grenade method, it's a lot easier to put the frames in there. All right, here. I already talked about if there's candy. It typically means that your bees have had less than 24 hours with their queen. Or um, there could be one other situation. It could be that the bees have actually been with the queen for the day or two, but the, the package rows were being shaken here locally off of bees that came back from almonds. And just the producers taking extra queens that they had ordered for making splits out in their apiary, and they're just making up some packages with them. And in that case, nine times out of 10, they're buying queens that have candy tubes, because when they're making splits, they're just taking a full hive and they make it into two there, or they're taking five frames out one by one, looking, making sure there's no queen on it, putting it in a brand new box, and they just, out of this box of 100 queens, they just pull one out of there, yep, she looks good, puts her down into there, and they start eating the candy, and they come back, and they'll monitor the hive and build it up as it needs to be. But that's another possibility why there was candy in the tube there is they're doing the one job of making splits, and they're just, oh, I need to make 10 packages today for these these few people, and they just shake some bees into there, and they put the queen cage in there, etc. and they're filling orders that way. All right, I talked about the mini cage, hanging up there if you've got the candy. Um, if you, if that syrup can that you pull out of your, your package here still is half full, um, you can actually feed that back to the bees. What did I do with the inner cover? So you could take like your inner cover here and put that syrup can right over it. And the bees can then come up from the bottom and go ahead and finish off the last of the syrup there. There's no reason to throw it in the trash if it's half full. But like the picture shows up there, you put the syrup can over it, grab an empty box, put it around it, and then you can put the cover over that just so that it's a nice sealed environment there. If you just put the inner cover here and the syrup can there, the bees would still be fine temperature wise, but just in case there was a raccoon or a possum that came sniffing around and stuff, you don't want them to knock the can over and already think there's something tasty in here and then start trying to get at your bees. All right. Get established after a few days. Typically, after your package has been there for a few days, you do want to come back and check on them. I mean, that's... Now you're a beekeeper, you have bees, so let's go back after a few days, look to see if they're making any comb, check and see how much of that uh, gallon of syrup that they've drank down and stuff there. See if they're bringing in some nice pollen from the environment and stuff. Um, after a few days, if you've had some nice warm weather and they've built enough wax in there, you should also see some nice uh, eggs being laid on some of those frames. And some people ask, how often should I get into my hive? You're beginning into this. You need to learn the practice. You need to get comfortable with your bees. So while I hate encouraging people to do this, do check on your bees every few days. 
I say I hate saying that because every day you go out there and you crack that hive open and you smoke them and stuff, you're disrupting their day and they won't do a very good job for the rest of that day going out and foraging. You, you, you ruin their day basically by opening them up. That's a nice way of putting it, but um, it, it disrupts their normal behavior and stuff. They're, Every, if so, if you're going out there every single day opening them up, you're really hindering their ability to go out and forage for nectar, for the queen laying process, for them going ahead and feeding the young and everything else. So try to space it out some. Now, as you become better and better at beekeeping, um, and you know how to spot the bad things that are happening in your hive, as you as you know what's going on at the hive during the different seasons and stuff, you might only check on that hive once every week or two. You start having 15 hives and you know your bee facts, you might not check on them for a month, month and a half at a time. I, I typically don't get out to a bee yard unless I know I have splits or there's a nectar flow going on or something that I have some actual work to do. I normally will go ahead and leave them for a month and a half to two and a half months alone from the time I drop them there to the time I come back just because I've got that many different bees I need to go tend to, that many jobs with my own apiary, with queen rearing and everything else. I know what's really happening in my yards and I know the blooms and if I know, know that I put the honey supers on them, I don't have to go back and check on them all, all the time. Yes. So when you buy a pack, and this might not be an intelligent question to ask, no, but when you buy a right. package of bees and the queen is good, do you lose, and you don't leave them in the trunk of your car, is there a percentage of those bees that, get, that you lose, or do you generally keep all of those starter package bees? Good question there. Okay. Bees live, you're, you're, Spring and summertime bees only live 30 to 45 days. So every day that goes by, there is a small number of bees that are hitting their 30th or 45th birthday and are croaking. Um, in addition to that, you know, that they did go through a stressful time um, getting shaken out of fully functioning good hives, down through a funnel, put into a package, and transported to you and stuff there. So, you can picture that if your package is three, four days old, you'll have a, a very thin layer of dead bees on the bottom of it. You should still be able to see the bottom of the package if it's, uh, if your package is like one day old, it could be completely spotless clean on the bottom surface down here. If it's two days old, you might have some speckling. If it's three days old, you might have just a little speckling of open space that you can see down there. If it's four days old, it might have a layer of bees down there. If it got problems with heat, freezing, or went through the mail, that's one of the things that we talked in another class, you don't know how many days it's gone through the mail. They use, a lot of times for the mail, they use another type of feed substance that's this jelly that's actually good for seven days. And if you have a package that's been outside of the hive for five, six days and you get it through the mail, you're going to have a thick layer of dead bees down there at that point and a smaller cluster. But once you get it into the hive, the bees being able to go out and forage, bring in new resources, being able to cluster up, move around, clean themselves, temperature regulate, that, that, that dying off process slows way down once you get them out of this. Another reason, get your package as soon as you can, get it installed as soon as you can. It's, it's healthier on the bees. Okay, here. So, so I mentioned already, check your feeder. That really, don't let it run out in the early spring there. If the bees are drinking it down, they need it. If you, after a week, the bees haven't touched your feeder at all, they didn't need it, you can get rid of it. One-to-one um, -one sugar water will turn into alcohol after a certain amount of time and a certain uh, warmth that's out there. And it's not going to be good alcohol, it's going to be the stinky type, so just dump it out of there and stuff. Um, even if there's, and I, there's going to be a slide here that argues with me, but 
even if there's a good nectar flow going on, if you use a feed stimulant in your your one-to-one -one sugar water, the bees are then going to hit it no matter what. And this can actually help you draw comb faster if you want a little trick of the trade here. Filling your internal feeder and putting Honey Bee Healthy or what's another one of the I know Honey Bee Healthy is the big name that's out there. It's a combination of lemongrass, mint, and a little bit of lavender. Uh, Hive Alive, that's another one. Um, the, these, it has a really good scent to it, and when you put it in the sugar water, the bees smell that and they're just attracted to it, and they just start drinking it down, drinking it down, drinking it down. And like I explained in another class, when a bee has a full belly of sugar and nowhere to put it, it then starts burning it internally and starts overheating and sweats wax out of those glands, basically. And then they just build wax on your frame. So, you want to force your hive to build wax really fast, just keep filling your feeder. You don't have to buy Honey Bee Healthy. You can actually put a couple, a couple drops of lemongrass or mint into your uh, feed mix and the bees will go crazy on it. Don't experiment too much with scents from the grocery store. Be like, oh, I think vanilla is going to be great just because it smells good to you. Uh, vanilla is not a big fan of the bees. Um, and if you put like a cherry flavor in there. The bees are actually going to stay the heck away from the feed because bees hate cherry scent. Uh, they actually use a derivative off of cherries to try to do a... Uh, fume board. A fume board. It doesn't work very well, but it it smells pleasant to you, but it, it it's not pleasant to the bees and it's meant to drive the bees out of your honey supers. When we get to that chapter for extracting, you'll find out if it stinks to you, it works really good for driving the bees out of there. If it smells good to you or okay to you, it doesn't do a very good job. So this is the slide I was saying is going to argue with me, where bees will choose to collect nectar rather than the syrup. That's just plain sugar water that they will ignore if there's a good nectar flow going on. If you put a feed stimulant in there, they're still going to hit it. Springtime, you do one-to-one, one. fall two-to-one, we've explained all those. You can go and buy plain old corn syrup. Don't go to the grocery store and try to buy corn syrup, okay? Because grocery store corn syrup is going to be astronomically expensive. You get a little bottle of corn syrup at the store, it's like three, four bucks, and to fill a gallon feeder, you're really talking like 10, 15 bucks then to have enough to fill a gallon feeder. Go to somewhere like Spring Valley Honey Farms that'll sell you five gallon buckets of corn syrup for like 35 cents a pound. And if you need to know the conversion there, a five gallon bucket is about 60 pounds. So 60 times 35 cents, you're, you're talking like 20 bucks to get a five gallon bucket of corn syrup. Jason, a question on that, Bill. So uh, mixing uh, one to one or two to one sugar, I would do mine by weight, not volume, but the slide says volume. You? Oh, I did not. I did not create this volume. I mean, this slide, but volume is incorrect. It's weight. It is it, by weight. By weight. Okay. It's it's not that. You just spitball it. Just yeah. spitball it. It's not like it is when you go to the two to one of the different feeding time. Yeah. If you, if you, you all of a sudden are putting up. like three to one together, you won't get all the sugar to dissolve pretty much. In, Unless you heat it up and you have to heat it up to a point that's not good for the sugar because you'll scorch it, it caramelizes, it gets a different flavor. The bees don't like to hit it and it's harder on their digestive system once it's been scorched. So This is, this is really, bees will take something other than one to one or two to one. If you're thinner yet on it or somewhere between one to one and two to one, they're still going to take it. Um, it's not a, not a precise thing. So you've got your bees all in here. They're all happy-go-lucky. And we've already talked about the division board feeder. In another class, we talked about top feeders. That's a type of top feeder where the bees can come up on, the, on both of the outsides there on those little screens. And the whole center there would be full of syrup. And that's one of those that's really tough to pick up and move off your hive because it, it's flexible plastic even and sloshes around. Uh, this is that Boardman feeder that we talked about that's an entrance feeder. I mean, it only costs two, three bucks to get one of those. They're the cheapest things out there. 
and you usually supply your own mason jar then for it, and you just try to pop the tiniest little holes possible in that mason jar lid with like a, a nail and a hammer. You just tap, 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 and then once you fill it up with syrup and flip it upside down, the viscosity of the liquid combined with suction and gravity and everything won't have it run out. It'll just form little droplets there that the bees can come up and drink. Well, the problem here is it's on the outside of your hive and that entices other bees to try to rob your bees because there's a food source right there saying, hey, there's something going on here. Another bad thing is with it being outside of your hive right here, if you have real cold weather, uh, 40 degrees, pretty much at 45 and below, your bees like to cluster up. Well, a cluster does not move out and try to walk through this and come up underneath and feed out of that jar. It's just going to stay in here. And if your temps just keep staying cold, they never break cluster and come out here to the feed, and they starve to death in there. That's why the division board feeder or internal feeding system is really good for that early springtime if you're going to have some cold weather. And then lastly, that jar on the outside of your hive really, really attracts raccoons and possums like no other. Okay, um, if you ever go out to your apiary and you've been using an entrance feeder and you keep finding it on the ground in front of your hive and it's empty, that's a raccoon that now knows that there's something good there. And even when you take that away, it's going to keep coming night after night, scratching on that hive and try eating the bees that are in your hive because raccoons and possums just love to get bees at night. They, they don't like to come out and attack, but they'll come out to the entrance and be checking things out and then they'll scoop them up in their mouth and they crush them down and they squish all the juices out of them and they swallow down the juices and they spit these little pellets out in front of your hive and stuff of dead bees and you just don't need that going on when the hive is just growing and you know just as a baby trying to get up on its feet. Okay, calendar for the first, bee, first year with bees. April to mid-May, spring maintenance, buildup, swarm control, IPM, which stands for Integrated Pest Management. That's uh, just non-chemical ways that you're trying to get rid of mites and other problem insects that get into your hives here. And this would be, um, you don't have to worry about swarm control so much, again, your first year. That would be something April to mid-May that you need to be thinking about year number two. Some of this stuff, some of this stuff is going to mislead you here a little bit if you don't take into consideration. We're trying to give you the facts for this year and possibly next year on these dates. So mid-May into July, your honey flow is going good. Um, this would be the time that they're really going to be putting wax on these frames good. They're going to be building into your second box. Um, you're getting into late June, you might, might have enough success that they're starting to want to build into your first honey super. Even though they had to do all that wax building your first year, you might get lucky with a good nectar flow that starts getting you into late June, early July there that they get that first honey super go. Let me drop a question on these. How would you guys know that? How would you guys know if maybe you should think about putting a super on there is a slide coming up here on the is 710 that? roll. All right. yes. I just remember it from popping through it really okay. quick here, but the 710 roll was it when seven out of seven out of the ten frames in this box are actively being used by the bees. You just stick another box on there. They'll finish the one and a half frames and the one and a half frames on either side as they work up into this box. And when this box has seven out of ten, you put the next one and so on. That's just a reminder from last class, especially if you're viewing this and didn't watch one of the prior ones. So August, a lot of people, their second year when they're coming into their honey harvest, August rolls around and they're like, oh, I've got a partial box on top that isn't capped over and I know it has to be capped over if I want to extract that honey and have it at the right moisture content so it won't ferment. So they'll, they'll wait until mid-August, and they still don't have it fully capped over, and they wait until late August. 
I really, really want to encourage you guys to say the heck with it. Pull your honey early in August, okay? You want to immediately go into, um, oh, it doesn't even say it there, no, but no, the no. moment you get your honey off, you need to be checking for mites. You need to be already mitigating any mites coming into your colony there. Uh, you're not supposed to put mite treat, most mite treatments you're not supposed to use while you have honey supers that could be for human consumption on. They're not going to give a stamp of approval on a pesticide that you're putting in your hive to kill a mite to be there with a food product, okay? So anyhow, all the mite treatment, God, I keep correcting myself, 90% of the mite treatments say you can't put it on while honey supers on. So pull your honey supers in early August, check your mite loads. Chances are, if you have Italians, Carniolans, Buckfast, uh, any of the, the non-hygienic, non-mite resistant bees out there, you almost certainly are going to need to treat for mites right then and there. If you have a mite resistant bee, you still have a pretty good chance that you're gonna have a slight saturation of mites and you're going to go, going to head that off before it becomes bad, okay? And why I want you to do this early. Think of this. If you wait until late fall, um, we saw on an early class, it takes 21 some days for an egg to turn into a mature bee, okay? You have mites in your hive. Mites carry disease. You've got a sick hive but it doesn't look sick to you because they've been on great pollen and great nectar up until this point. You're going into August when all your nectar dries up. Stress is going to kick into your colony. As you get into September, October, November, the population of your hive shrinks up because the queen slows down her egg laying and everything else. Well, mites don't slow down their egg laying, so all of a sudden, you go from 80,000 bees in your hive down to 20,000 bees. And your mites were, say, two mites to every 100 bees. And they were climbing up there where if your population had not changed at all, they might be up to six mites per every bee by late fall time. You don't want six mites per bee. Let alone, now you've gone from 80,000 bees to, let's say, 20,000 bees. So you have a fourth of the population you now had, and you have six mites to that fourth population. It's really going to boil down to then 24 mites per bee if you did a check right then and there. Because the math is crossing, you know, your, your population is dropping down on your bees, your mites are going up. And when you do that sampling of per 100 bees, you're now at 24 mites per bee. That is a horrific, tragic point to be at, to get that high. And the, you'll want to read over that stuff, research the charts that tell you um, at what time of year, what number of mites are okay. And we have a, a pest pathogens problem uh, chapter we'll get to here that will really cover that in depth there. But, so back to the issue at hand. If you don't start in early August mitigating your mites and getting your disease down, and you wait until September, October to do this, well, you've lost all those weeks that you could have been getting ahead of this. Because you treat for mites in second week of August. 21 days later, you have a new generation of bees that are born out. But that generation of bees were cared for by the, the older generation that was sick from mites and got dosed with a chemical treatment to get rid of an insect on an insect. Okay, so you put a pesticide in there. So that harmed your hive. They don't do a very good job of raising that next generation. Does that make sense to you? You know, they're, they're sick, they don't feel like doing work, they've just been dosed with a chemical and stuff there. So they just kind of do mediocre week feeding, uh, work feeding those larvae and stuff there. So you don't get very fat, juicy, healthy larvae. So those larvae are born and now they're in a hive that's mostly disease free and mostly 
um, over the chemicals from the other one, but they didn't get all the nutrition and stuff. So they do a pretty good job of feeding that next generation 20 day, 21 days out from them there that rolls over into your hive there. You're getting later into fall here. That generation is healthier yet, and at some point, that colony is like, we're going into winter, and they, tr they do the best job they can to feed the fattest, juiciest, healthiest bees to go into your winter cluster. You got to, as uh, Dr. Connor always has uh, said over the years, and different other uh, bee specialists have always said, you feed the bee, or you take care of the bees, that take care of the bees, that take care of the bees, that go into winter. You wait until late October and you only get one generation of bees popping through there. They just don't get bees that last November, December, January, February, March till that bloom hits and they can start putting new children into the hive there, okay? I want to drive that home to you guys. So my advice is pull your honey early in August. If you've got some frames that aren't good enough for moisture content, Feed it back to them. Just set that box in front of the hive there. The bees, if it's August, nectar sources are drying up, they're in one day's time going to suck all the honey out of those open frames, and they're going to put it back where it should be in your two deeps here to backfill for that 80 pounds you want to go into winter time with. Make sense? Uh, you can also justify in your head that if you had one to, what is it, two frames that aren't fully capped over, mm -hmm. and you had eight frames that are fully capped over, you probably have low enough moisture content in those eight that when you mix all this in an extractor or a five-gallon bucket, you're still going to be under the threshold. It's just if you have three frames, four frames, five frames that aren't capped over, it's just give that back to the bees. Don't even try wasting your time. You had a question? If you put the... the unfinished honey open in front of that hive, aren't you just welcoming robbing and you, that could just bleed right into your hubby hive? If you have a bunch of bees in the area of other beekeepers, that would be a concern for you. Um, I have seen where people have tried to put like a, a like a vision board kind of in there and stuff, a board in between the two and try to get the bees to pull that out of there. It doesn't work really well. Um, you could just simply, instead of putting it right in front of your hive, they're going to find it no matter what. You could put it, you know, 50 feet over there and that's not really enticing anybody over to that colony. That's you exactly don't have to put it close. That's exactly what I do. Um, in my situation, since I keep so many bees on my property for the, the mating purposes and everything there, I still extract in my barn there. And I love, 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 love to feed all those colonies on my property by taking all the wet honey supers and setting them outside. And I have a trailer that I just lay down the sheet, that painter's plastic, you know, that you can just get for your floors and stuff. I just lay a sheet of that out on my trailer. And I take all these tons of wet cappings that I have from my machinery. I just, I don't own a, a, a wax separator to get that out of there, but I feed my bees with it. I dump it all on the trailer and I spread it out so that it's just like an inch thick over there. And I get every bee, buddy's bees within five miles hitting that spot there. But they'll clean every bit of honey out of that stuff in half a day. It doesn't matter how much I put out of there. Just bees show up and they clean it up and the next day I haul all the cappings inside and I bring out a new batch. Just day after day I'm doing that. But I don't put it right in the middle of my apiary. I've got it away from my hives in the middle of my driveway basically doing that at the farm. And I don't have robbing problems with that. They leave the cappings? Well the bees aren't going to carry the wax away. But because my machinery has cut the wax cappings off and I've drained as much honey as I can get out of there, there's still a ton of honey in that. It'll be like a mass of Play-Doh at that point that's honey and wax there that's solid. And I just spread it out and the bees just 
They dig their way through it, licking the whole time, and once they clean enough of the wax up there that they can't get anymore, they just dig further down in the pile there and push the stuff around, and they just get all the honey out of that. I come back, and I've got beautiful dry cappings that I then just put into a whole bunch of five-gallon buckets, and then in the wintertime when I've got nothing to do, we'll go, I say me, my wife mainly does it, she uh, puts all these giant kettles on the stove and renders down the wax and does all the cleaning process to it, and we then pour bricks of it and use it for making candles and lip balms and whatever uh, other stuff. So More classes to come. More next, classes to come. Next yeah. week is honey production. I think the week after that is products to hide, including wax. Son of a guy, I'm taking so long to explain You're stuff. on a roll. I don't want to stop you. So September, October, uh, you would be feeding if necessary. Again, you need 80 pounds of honey to get up going into winter. If you have Italians, maybe go 100 pounds. 110 pounds, 120 pounds. I mean, get, get, get them heavier because they're going to go into winter with a bigger cluster because the queen doesn't like to stop laying. That's the one breed you need to give them a little more honey to get them through the winter time. Uh, November through March, uh, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of your kickback time of the year. You would at some point in January, February time Want to go out there on like a 40, 45 degree day and check your hive. And we'll get into winter maintenance and stuff there later on. Um, this is kind of talking more now on the slide where it's saying education, equipment, maintenance, preparations, and stuff like that. That's what you're doing now. You're taking education. You're buying your equipment. You're, you're getting ready for this spring here. And uh, usually, what is our ISPA? March or uh, November? November. Uh, for the annual conference? Annual conference. Which yeah, is, it's in November. I don't know the exact date off of my head. Right, it changes, but it's a good time to get more education, buy some equipment, um, meet other beekeepers. Yeah, and uh, IHPA, that, that annual conference is fantastic. It's a two-day event. They have speakers from all over the country that they bring in there. That They give basic classes and very advanced classes, so you'll find something for everybody's taste of education there. SIBA uh, does a great winter uh, seminar that they put on. Theirs is actually happening here in March. Um, I can't remember the exact date. It's, it's on the Iowa Honey Producers website there also. Uh, do, you, do you happen to remember the date? Or are you looking that up on your calendar there? I think it's the 19. 19, okay. Um, and then there's a summer field day that also the IHPA throws on that'll give you some good introductory classes there as well. How much more do you got, Jason? Because we can stop here, or if you only have a few frames left, we can finish it out. Well, it doesn't tell me on. Hold on a second. It does if I do this. We actually have quite a bit. We so have, let's, let's pause here because next week I think it's just my production. And that's. We would have seven, seven slides of learning and then all those, the 10. Slides of showing frames of bees. I just go place to stop. Okay, we work our bees. We talk about that to start next time because that's that's a whole new topic and we're at the time. And then honey production management. I don't think that's a really heavy heavy uh, class. I, I'm sorry. Sometimes there's just I trail off with the education uh, stuff good. there and it goes on tangents. I, I apologize for. So no, knowing that not have, squeezing it all in here tonight. Knowing that we have a class coming up on honey production, on products of the hive, on winter maintenance, we'll, we'll address that. Other things you've heard about today, do you guys have any questions before we call it a night? Where do you find the, the videos? Uh, on Facebook, if you search for Friendly Beekeepers of Iowa. Okay. I'm posting the YouTube links directly on. Um, Friendly Beekeepers of Iowa, unfortunately, they don't have their own YouTube channel I have from a few years ago, those videos I did on making hive equipment and stuff like that. I've just been dumping the videos onto my, my own personal page and then I put the link onto the Friendly Beekeepers. Yeah. You said before you were bees, we talked about also in earlier weeks, bees live about 45 days or so? 30 to 45 days. They they work themselves to death in the summertime. Yeah. Okay. Well, in the wintertime, are they still hatching the whole time or do they yeah. live longer over the winter? So wintertime, some people will say that the winter bees are a special bee all on their own. I think they're just fattened up really and it's not like they're magically different, but those bees going into wintertime haven't been through the rigors of all the foraging and stuff there. 
they've been born and they've stayed in the hive and there is the factors of while they stay in a cluster that's 92 degrees vibrating their wings for friction heat and stuff there in the center mass the bees on the outside are moving really sluggish they have a slower metabolism all through the winter time and they can live three to four months through a winter season as opposed to 30 to 45 days. Mm -hmm. And at some point there, after the, I always forget the term, is it the solstice, where Summer it's the shortest season. day of the year? Winter solstice, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometime after there, most breeds of bees will start putting a few little eggs on the frames and starting to try to keep them warm. They don't try to do a whole lot of brood rearing because at that time of year, they don't have the resources in there, so they're actually giving resources out of their body to feed the, the young. That's why if you have a, a winter that all of a sudden starts going mild, harsh, mild, harsh, harsh. mild, harsh, it, it just beats the crap out of your bees, okay? That's, those are the years you hear the people lose the most colonies, and they'll be like, this was beautiful, this was great, this was great, and then they died while they still had food on them, and it's... A lot of times you'll find partial, you'll find frames that have capped brood on them and it's because all of a sudden you had four or five days that were nice and the queen tried laying some eggs and then you had two or three days that were bad and it got cold enough they couldn't keep that larva alive and it killed them. Well, a week later you have a warm spell again and they tried rearing some brood but then you get a cold snap again and it killed it. It just, it's too much stress. You'd rather it just be a harsh winter and then start to warm up and go into spring. That's the best year you can hope for. Okay. All right, are there any more questions? Let's call a night. Good yeah. class, everyone. Um, so I got high. Yeah. So when you start feeding them again, but you know, like your frame feeders and all, I, I put all of that. Okay, the top. okay. So like you're coming out of winter? Yeah, well, like, well, we'll cover that in the okay. wintering chapter really well. Okay. Any other over tonight stuff? All right. Let's call it Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.